Turn the lights. Aha! Yes! got the lights? The Zodiac Stone! Oh. Thanks. <laughs> Soon the power of these unstoppable beasts will be ours. Of a crying out loud. <laughs> I got a bunch of deadly Chotskys on my tail. Uh, um. uh, are you Buzz Lightyear? No, ho, ho. I'm Santa Claus, citizen. Ho, oh, oh. ho. Okay, if you want to sound jolly, you've got to push from the diaphragm. Ho, ho, ho. Good tip. Thank you. That's not why I'm here, Lightyear. Only you can help me. And you are... Santa Claus! <laughs> now, the, the very next time this happens, I should be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time disturbing people on such a night? Speak up! Oh, Badger, it's me, Rat, and my friend Mole. We've lost our way in the snow. Please let us in. Why, Ratty, me dear little man, C come along in. You must be perished, both of you. Well, I've never lost in the wild wood and in the snow. And I just started again. Uh, voiceover real. Yeah. Hello, my beautiful Indian brother. Can I come in? I got a vision that needs interpreting. So I've heard. There was an Indian. I couldn't see his face, but he was a big guy, about yay tall and yay wide, wearing a magnificent buffalo headdress. And he was making love to my wife. Dale, I'm not sure. Hold I... on, there's more. I suddenly found myself in a hospital, watching Nancy give birth to Joseph, except Joseph was wearing the exact same headdress as the faceless Indian. So working backwards, I fathered an Indian child, therefore, I am an Indian. Okay, that's one interpretation. <laughs> so do you have a regular place you buy your feathers and bonnets and so forth? Oh my God. <laughs> well, ready or not, coming to you live from the Bay Area Pizza Cabin, it's Papa Bear's Pizza Band. <laughs> Howdy, kids. <laughs> Yikes. Oh, I cannot believe stuff like this is still around. Okie dokie, band. Let's count down to party time. Woohoo! I like the sound of that. And one, two, three, four. Pizza. I'm cruising around town. Following the time down. Down, 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 down. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bruce. Hello, Bruce. It has been three weeks since my last fish, on my honour, or may I be chopped up and made into soup. You're an inspiration to all of us. I mean. <laughs> right then, who's next? Oh, 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 pick me, pick me, pick me. Yes, the little Sheila down the front. Woo! Come on up here. That's it, run. Ow! Try biting me now, Ant. From the afterlife. You know, I've been interviewed by all of them. Regis, <laughs> Kathy Lee, Regis and Kathy Lee. Right. I'd like to say that I think this show is very bad. Okay. And should be stopped. No, okay. I think you're a bad person and don't take this the wrong way all right but i think you represent evil yeah and your presence makes any kind of progress in the universe impossible hold on a second conan moltar this ant has come back from the dead 
It must be one of those self-repeating immortal Franken ants. It's probably just another different ant. A second ant? No, no. It's his brother avenging the death of his twin. It's his twin brother! Really? <laughs> It's hopeless, absolutely hopeless. You're telling me I'm losing to a bird! Oh, but that poor gypsy girl. I'm beginning to feel the worst. I know, but now don't you say anything to upset Quasimodo. He's worried enough already. Yeah, you're right. We better lighten up. Shh, shh, shh. Here he comes. Now just stay calm. Not a word. Easy does it. Stone-faced. Any sign of her? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a lost cause! She could be anywhere! In the stocks, in the dungeon, on the rack! Oh, God. Nice work, Victor. <laughs> if you start dropping bombs on an active entropy pump, the results would be disastrous, as in destroying reality for a distance of several light years disastrous. Why don't you just go back in time and destroy the engine or something? Traveling in time weakens the fabric of space. The reality in Los Soledad is already paper thin. So you can't go there yourself? No. In any case, I have other business demanding my attention, even more crucial, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You cribbed that from those movies. I'm a time traveler. How do you know I won't eventually say it first? Stay back! Harvey, please, let me help you. You, you saw what was happening. You knew something was terribly wrong with me. I thought you were my friend. You should have been able to help me, but you didn't. Now look at me! But I tried, Harvey. I... Harvey! Why didn't you save me? And what you got growing there, Robbo? Can't tell you, Mr. B. Top secret. Robbie invented a special plant that doesn't grow regular beans and makes Holly! Licorice flavored jelly beans. Ma, uh, make her stop. This is my secret experiment. Holly. Sounds awfully scientific. I've been watering this normal everyday bean plant with my own spit mixed with chewed up licorice to try to grow beans that don't taste like gross vegetables. I like vegetables. You also like pink. Of course, Isabel. I wouldn't miss that for the world. Up you go. <laughs> Can we have another parade tomorrow? I'm afraid you'll have to wait until next year, Isabel. The Victory Parade is an annual event. Victory Parade? How come it's called a Victory Parade? Well, <laughs> that's a long story, my dear. Good. Yeah, tell us. Yes. Please, Papa. Well. Come on. Yeah, come on. But. Please. But. How can you refuse? <laughs> All right. You wanted this all along. You brought her and her ship here, got them on her side. Why? Because the others got warriors like you and I. They needed a reason to fight, so I gave them one. Betrayal. And I got her to give me these, with a little good old Earth compassion. But you're risking the lives of our people. Aren't you afraid that- No! I will not spend my life in fear of the Earth like my father. The Earth will fear me. But why did you pair her with me? Honestly, it was the only way I could get her to move here. She actually liked you, Penumbra. Said you reminded her of her brother. I just want to say, 
If there was no Batman, there'd be no Joker, and I'd never have met my pudding. Joker twisted her mind. Ha! You're just jealous because you don't have a fella who's as loving and loyal to you as my pudding is to me. <sighs> <laughs> would have been the ones to send Raj his invitation, so he must know something about him. Huxley? I know you don't like to talk WCL business, but what can you tell me about Raj Dynamite? Sloane, my dearest sister, how nice of you to drop by. Say, how about this weekend we do some charity work together? Charity? Work? Together? But you hate all those things. Hey, boss. Have we told you how much we love working for you? Okay. I'm uh, I'm just gonna head out. Hey, what is this? Hello. My name is Watsy Doo. What's yours? that ends with yakky doodle yeah <laughs> okay we're now going to um okay next one up <coughs> let's go okay we're now going to honor bernie mattinson and speaking on behalf of bernie mattinson is uh, eric and susan goldberg <coughs> what can we say about bernie mattinson he was a legend in the animation industry and certainly at Disney Animation. Uh, we both miss him very, very much. We used to have lunch with him at the Smokehouse uh, once a week. And uh, Bernie was an amazing guy. He was very quiet and unassuming, but immensely talented and did practically everything that could be done at the studio. Um, he died just shy of 70 years working at the Walt Disney Company. He was the longest employee of the Walt Disney Company ever. Not just Disney Animation, the Walt Disney Company. And I don't think anyone's ever going to beat that record. One story I'd like to tell is about Great Mouse Detective. This was at a time when uh, the studio was transitioning. Um, and it was the first time that Michael Eisner, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Peter Schneider were coming into the studio to work with Disney Animation. And they weren't sure, you know, whether they wanted to continue animation or not. They really felt the Black Cauldron had not worked very well. Bernie managed to get off of the Black Cauldron and started to develop with Ron Clements, the Great Mouse Detective, which was called Basil of Baker Street then. And he had done some boarding and Roy Disney called him up and said, so this, this is going to be a very important pitch. You better do well. Okay. So they get 
Jeffrey and Peter and Michael in a room, start pitching the boards and nobody's interested. Everybody's kind of looking around and the board and so on and so forth. And Bernie has one ace up his sleeve. He says, I have a story reel I would like to show you of this particular sequence. And it was the barroom sequence in The Great Mouse Detective. Uh, and he ran the sequence with scratch dialogue and with his boards. And it actually worked very, very well. From that point, you know, the executives were satisfied and he found out later from Roy that they had greenlit the movie to go forward. Um, what had happened was when they saw the story reel, they understood, oh, that's how we can be involved in the animation process. Before animation takes place, we can edit things, we can change things during the story reel uh, process. Um, and Roy then told him, you know, it's a good thing that this went through because uh, they were going to shut down animation and really just asset strip it and, and use the old library and not create anything new if this pitch hadn't worked. So when Bernie told me this story, I said, Bernie, you saved Disney animation. And he went, yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> if it weren't for Bernie, I don't think the Disney Renaissance would have happened and I don't think a lot of us would have been in the animation industry. So I would just like to say thank you so much to Bernie for all the things that he has done. And we miss you, Bernie. Animation isn't the same without you. And besides, who could wear shorts better than you? <laughs> Thanks. You can see uh, later on when this is on YouTube, you can see the full version of that of that cut. I actually like the original was something like nine minutes long, something. So we had to edit a little bit, but but all the stuff will be available on online. Um, we now like to honor um, Brad McLeod and who's, what was this? Who's up? Oh, Ian McGinty. I'm sorry. All right, do I have that here? Huh. On the next page. Maybe to the next one. Yeah, Brad was kind of a late minute substitution. Ah, there he is. Okay. Okay, Ian McGinty. And speaking about Ian McGinty is Charlie Cavan. Nice. Thanks. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Let me adjust the mic a little bit here. Um, James Ian McGinty was born on May 6th, 1985 in Annapolis, Maryland. He pursued his artistic education at St. Mary's College of Southern Maryland and the Savannah College of Art and Design. Ian's career in comics began with notable contributions such as Adventure Time Candy Capers in 2013 uh, and Suckers, a vampire comedy comic published by Zoetrope. Transitioning to more significant projects or even more high significance projects uh, like Bravest Warriors. He showcased his penciling skills across multiple issues. Ian's journey continued as he became the main artist for the Adventure Time series in 2016. Again, we're talking comics. <laughs> Maintaining this role for almost two years before delving into Boom Studios' Rockers Modern Life series in 2018. Clearly a story beginning to any career. But I think Ian said it best about how his interest in art developed in his own words. In an interview with sjgames.com, Ian said, my style started as a fairly basic copy and paste job of old newspaper comics, Calvin and Hobbes, The Far Side, Garfield, that sort of thing. I read them all and traced the characters, cutting them out and pasting them on paper to make new stories. I didn't really think much about comics again, until around high school when I got into Joan and Vasquez, Johnny the Homicidal Maniac and Squee Comics. These were comics that had heavy lines and extreme angles, black and white art and combined cute characters with extreme gore and disgusting monsters and all that awesome stuff. Um, later, uh, again, this is still Ian's words, later working on properties like Adventure Time, Bravest Warriors and Steam Universe really refined my art, taking it into a direction away from heavy inking and more focused on enhancing the color and designing unique characters. 
So to quote a friend, I have a quote, natural talent of combining disgustingly cute and disgustingly disgusting, end quote. In 2015, Ian's comic, Welcome to Showside, was selected to be adapted into an independent pilot. I don't know if you guys are like super aware, but there's a lot of indie animation happening lately. It's been kind of a big craze, um, but Ian was ahead of the curve uh, by years. Um, so yes, his comic, uh, Welcome to Showside, was adapted into an independent pilot. Ian was ahead of the curve predating productions like Hasman Hotel and the Amazing Digital Circus by creating a popular, uh, among other artists, of course, a popular 22 minute episode through completely independent channels that went on YouTube. Once again, I'll let Ian tell us about Showside in his own words. I've always been into monsters and where we live in Savannah, Georgia is known for being haunted and having spooky ghosts and sort of like a swamp, you know, back there. It's really cool. So I wanted to tell a story about this kid who like me when I was a kid felt a little outcast. Because when I was a kid, I would just draw all the time, didn't really have a lot of friends and stuff like that. And I really didn't like school. I would just doodle all day long, get into trouble with my teachers because I was failing all my classes because I wouldn't do anything but draw, end quote. These are the facts of the beginning of Ian's admirable and spirited career successes. I'll be honest with you. The way that I'm moving away from notes here, the way that I... I met Ian and I wish I got to know him a little bit more. Um, last year uh, in the production of a pilot that I was working on uh, independently, um, I wanted to find somebody who would knock the comic out of the park. Um, and I was lucky to meet Ian for a short amount of time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Those are the, I don't have all of the facts about the end of, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> his career in life, but I'm not just here to talk about cold facts. Ian's story simultaneously serves as an impressive accomplishment and a highlight of the all too common ways that artists can, can have their enthusiasm and hard work taken advantage of. I hesitate to use that term, taken advantage of, because I fully believe Ian knew the trials and struggles of the comic industry and went into it with full eyes open. I don't know exactly how he felt about this, but if it was me, I would want people to talk about the negative about the industry as well as the positive. Ian's passing inspired the creation of the comics, hashtag comics broke me, hashtag. And it led to a lot of people powerfully speaking out about the occasionally hellish struggles of the comic industry. Overwork was the norm for Ian. Ian is now in a place where he can rest peacefully. And I have to believe he's there with the knowledge that he inspired and entertained so many people. I thought I would close out this little remembrance with Ian's own words about his work and philosophy that resonate with me personally a lot. Quote, I'm not catering to a specific demographic. I don't want to. But with that lies the challenge of making something cool to read and look at for very young kids and very old people and everyone in between, all genders, all races, etc. But at the same time, I refuse to candy coat everything. Basically, all ages doesn't mean for kids. And I think kids are way, way smarter than the industry often gives them credit for. I won't pander to a nine-year-old or a 99-year-old. And I hope the readers of my work recognize that it's OK to have monsters and demons and scary stuff in your all ages comic or animated series or whatever medium you choose to get your stuff out. I was quoted in an interview a while back saying, it's okay to be scared. And I stand by that still. It's okay to be a little scared or happy or sad or angry. That's what it is to be human. Thank you. Check out his work. Okay, now we're going to honor uh, Brad McLeod and uh, speaking uh, for, about, for about Brad McLeod is uh, Nancy Beeman. Okay, this was written by what? Oh, sure. <laughs> Just for me. Yeah. Okay. That's the June story. So. Oh, okay. I'm in good company. Okay. 
Okay, this is from Nancy Beeman about Brad McLeod. Brad McLeod accomplished more in his 39 years on earth than many, many people accomplish in 70. He was a designer and special effects animator, a professor of animation, a musician, a published author of illustrated children's books, my student and my friend. Brad was a standout among his classmates from his first days in my Sheridan storyboard class of 2010. He had a quirky and original sense of humor that did not follow the fashionable story cliches of the day. He was quick to ask questions and was always available to help his classmates with story problems. Brad even helped another student who was not yet in the animation program, offering them encouragement and support. Brad always thought of helping others. His illustrated children's books raised funds for CAM, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. He produced documentary films about endangered cultures, including hand-drawn animation. Later in his career, Brad taught in the Sheridan Animation Program and was a great favorite with the students. When I last saw him in November 2022, he had a noticeable urgency in his speech and acted as if he had to get a lot done in a short period of time. Little did I know how little time he had left. He passed suddenly on December 3rd, 2023, a month after his 39th birthday. In one of his storyboard assignments for my class, Brad had a chicken die of chicken pox, ascend to heaven and promptly infect the angels and St. Peter. The chicken is sent to hell where she infects his satanic majesty and all the demons. <laughs> Satan kicks her to the Garden of Eden, where she infects Adam and Eve and knocks an apple off the tree of life into Eve's hands, fade to blackout. <laughs> it's a great story as it, should be, as it should be since it was written by an angel. Brad has them smiling and laughing in heaven right now without the itching. It was an honor to have this remarkable man as a student and a friend. That was Nancy Beeman. We now um, got the next one up. Okay, we're going to be honoring uh, Russell Merritt, and speaking on behalf of Russell is uh, a, a audio message from JB Kaufman. I'm J.B. Kaufman, and I'd like to say a few words about Russell Merritt. Actually, I'd like to say a lot of words about Russell Merritt, but I've been asked to keep this short. Russell was a really great friend of mine, and I'm proud to say a collaborator, too. I actually had the honor of working with him on several projects. And I can say that Russell was one of the few authentic geniuses I've ever met. His interest in animation was one part of a larger, overarching passion for film history in general and he was easily one of the most brilliant film historians in the world. In fact, his intellect was so prodigious that it might have been intimidating to the rest of us. But it wasn't, because he wasn't all brain. He was also all heart. He had an endless curiosity about life in general, and he loved to learn new things, but he also loved to share them with others. Where a lesser intellect might have been insecure and wanted to hoard knowledge, Russell was just the opposite. His enthusiasm was contagious, and when he made a new discovery, he couldn't wait to share it with others, bring them in on it. I've said this before, but I'm sorry, here it comes again. I really think that you could have introduced Russell to just about anybody. Total stranger, well, maybe English speaking, we'll narrow it down that much, but total stranger, and within 10 minutes, he would have been one of their best friends, and he would have been telling them things about their favorite subject that they never knew before. In that way, I think he enriched the lives of everybody who ever read any of his writing, but even more, those of us who were fortunate enough to know him. The tunnel vision that so many of us have in our approach to research and writing never afflicted Russell. He had the capacity to link one idea with another in a seemingly unrelated discipline in a way that freshly illuminated both. Years ago at a conference, I heard Russell give a brilliant presentation on Disney's Pinocchio. In time, he adapted that talk to other uses. 
He gave a version of it as a bonus extra on a DVD, and later still, he reworked it as a lecture in his animation classes at Stanford and Berkeley. When I had the opportunity to write a book on Pinocchio, I got Russell to put that talk in writing, and we included it as a special chapter in the book. And now I'm so thankful we did that, because now that portion of his brilliance has been preserved for posterity. Of course, that was only one small fragment, and there is much more to be preserved. Some of Russell's writing has already been captured in print, and some of us are engaged in an effort to save the rest. But for now, I just want to pause to observe his passing. For those of us who knew him, his loss is a tragic one. But on the other hand, our cup is more than half full, and we should be thankful that he stayed with us as long as he did. And actually, when I was thanking our volunteers before, I'd also like to give a special thanks to our editor, William Holhauser, who's uh, working on the East Coast. But uh, he's the person who's taking all these clips and films and things from Guadalajara and Kalamazoo and Ireland and Australia and, you know, and making a coherent show. And he edited together all the photographs and all, all the clips and things. So thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We're now going to honor uh, Ken Mundy, and speaking on behalf of, for, for Ken is Morgan Mundy. Is she here? Oh, so the, uh, is it a clip? An audio clip. A clip? Okay. I've got something to read if we can't get the clip. Okay. Is there a clip? Would you send it to me? Oh, here it is. Hello, my name is Morgan oh, Mundy, and I've been given the opportunity to say a few words about my father, Ken Mundy. I'm not sure how many of you knew him personally, but if you did, you know that he was a class clown at heart. He wanted to make the people around him laugh and feel at ease. He'd do things like put shoes on his knees and walk around like Tim Conway. If you did a photo with him, chances are he would hold up two fingers behind your head for some impromptu bunny ears or make a silly face and just ruin the entire photo. He also liked playing pranks. One time, uh, a close friend of his was working on an electrical socket and he snuck up behind his friend and went, Bzzz. the friend jumped like five feet. And after the initial shock wore off, they laughed about it for years afterwards. That's who he was, who he wanted to be when circumstances were good. Unfortunately, and I'm sure you can relate, circumstances were not always good. His upbringing was rough. You know, as a kid, he was hospitalized with rheumatic fever. Uh, his father was an abusive alcoholic. And there was this small thing called the Great Depression that he had to live through. I think that upbringing gave him a very strong sense of right and wrong. It was that sense of right and wrong that led him to join the Marines at age 17 to fight in World War II. It was also that sense of right and wrong that put him at odds with people who didn't value artists or their work. One time, a studio head said, I can pull anyone off the street to do an animator's job. And he made it a point to call that guy an idiot to his face and he might have used more colorful language. I think that maybe later in life he regretted his willingness to stand up to anyone, but I'm glad he did because it gives me the courage to stand up against things like AI art. He also had a very strong work ethic. I remember one time I had an art project for school, and I started working on it the day before I had to turn it in because, you know, that's what kids do. Anyway, it wasn't turning out very well, and I brought it to him and said, how do I make this look like I spent a lot of time on it? He ushered me to the kitchen table, and we worked on it together for the entire night, from like 6 p.m. to like, I don't know, 11 p.m., something like that. Anyway, uh, by the end, I had something really impressive thanks to his guidance, and he said, now it looks like you worked on it for a long time, because you did. He was that kind of a teacher, willing to share his knowledge with anyone who asked. Back in the early 2000s, he had a small painting class for me and my friends. He taught us how to draw and paint and animate. And he also had an animation course at the local community college that he taught out of his home. I'd wake up Saturday mornings and a whole host of people would be in our living room learning to animate. The thing that he looked for in people that he hired and that he taught was honesty and potential. He'd ask students something like, did that turn out the way you wanted? And he was impressed if someone was honest enough to say no. And if someone wasn't polished, that didn't mean that they weren't going to be great. He went to bat for people in the industry who are on the cusp of being fired because he saw their potential. 
and some of those people went on to win Emmys. He often told me that a lot of the things he accomplished in his life was because he was too stupid to think that he couldn't. But I've always thought he was wrong about that. Later in life, I found that many of his insights, both into people and to the animation industry as a whole, have been almost entirely correct. Maybe that insight came with experience. He was 59 when I was born. Growing up, I remember him working all night in his home studio to meet deadlines and storyboarding and animation. At a time in his life when most people were burnt out or retired, he kept going. When the work dried up, he went to work at the local theater, schlepping 50-pound bags of Coke and popcorn upstairs in his 70s. The thing is, he didn't ignore life or leisure for the sake of his job. He played just as hard as he worked. He was an athlete, and he spent his free time training for things like tennis, speed skating, and skiing because he loved doing those things. And he participated in all of them until he was like in his 90s. In fact, up until around 2017, he and I would play tennis, and I could never beat him. He taught me how to live a balanced life, how to work, how to play, how to draw, and I think most importantly, how to love. He loved my mom more than anything. He never put her down and encouraged her in everything she did. Whenever my mom was out of earshot and doing something, he would lean to me and say, your mom's the cutest little guy, isn't she? Or your mom's the greatest or something like that all the way until the end of his life. He was unapologetically lovey-dovey until the day he died. And that's the kind of person he was. Loving, tenacious, hardworking, stubborn principled and insightful. His career is a reflection of that. I wish I had more time to talk about him and his career, but time is short. I hope this gives you some idea of who he was, and I'd like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to talk about him today. We now like to honor William Orcutt, and speaking about William Orcutt is Art Leonardi. And who's, who's, who's reading for art? Ah, there we go. <clears throat> you all know that I'm not Art Leonardi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is very short. Bill and I had been close friends for years. I will always consider Bill to be one of my best friends. I met Bill when we both worked at DePatty Freeling. Bill was production supervisor and I was in the animation department. We kept in touch even though we were no longer working together. Since we both belonged to the Motion Picture Academy, we would meet at the theater to watch the movie screenings. Bill would drive all the way from San Diego. Always a pleasure to see him. Bill was a terrific guy. It was a sad day when I heard the news that he had passed. I will continue to miss him dearly. My heart felt condolences to Bill's family. Bill, until we meet again. Sincerely, Art Leonardi. We're now going to <clears throat> honor Bruce Petty and um, Bruce was an Australian political cartoonist and filmmaker. Uh, he directed the short film Leisure, which won the Academy Award for Best Animated Short in 1975. Uh, it's one of the few Australian animated films to win such an honor. So that's, that's Bruce, Bruce Petty. Go on, go on to the next page. There we go. Okay, we're now going to talk about uh, Dwayne Poole. And uh, speaking about uh, Dwayne, I have Dave, Dave Brain listed. Oh, you're going to read it, Jeff? Yeah. Jeff, you're going to read it. Okay. I'm Jeff Massey, and I'm reading about uh, Dwayne Poole. Dwayne Poole was born September 15, 1948. He lost his valiant fight with cancer on April 1, 2023. He is survived by his loving husband of 22 years, Frank Bonaventure. 
Dwayne was destined to be in show business when at the age of seven months, he won first runner up in the Gerber baby photo search. In, in Washington State, he attended Kennewick High School, graduating with honors. Dwayne then attended the University of Washington on a partial scholarship. Shortly after graduation, he worked in children's television for King World Productions in Seattle, where he caught the attention of Hanna-Barbera Studios, which brought him to Los Angeles, and he joined their production team, where he created programming for them and Sid and Bobby Croft. The programs included A Flintstones Christmas, The Smurfs, and Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. Scrappy-Doo was Dwayne's creation. In 1982, Dwayne, Dwayne joined Aaron Spelling's team of writers and producers. Dwayne wrote many movies of the week throughout the 1990s. Later, Dwayne wrote numerous Hallmark Channel and Lifetime movies. One of Dwayne's biggest passions was the theater. He is the librettist for the musical adaptation of his TV film, A Christmas Memory. He enjoyed being an advisory board member of the Musical Theater Guild and wrote many fundraising events for them honoring Stephen Sondheim, Stephen Schwartz, Tom Jones, and Harvey Schmidt. Dwayne loved traveling the world and entertaining in his home with his husband, Frank. Their holiday gatherings and gourmet dinner parties became so popular that people requested to be put on a waiting list if a guest canceled at the last minute. He was a loving, loyal, and caring and caring friend with a sense of humor that made you laugh until you cry. He will be greatly missed. Okay, we now like to honor Dick Rao. He used to be the former president of Asifa East and uh, also of the Optical House. And the speaking about Dick is uh, Yvette. Susan Brand. Oh, so who's? Susan Brand. Susan Brand? Oh, okay. We'll be speaking. All right. Hi. Um, Dick Rao. Dick Rao was well known for his enthusiasm and warm and generous spirit in the small world of New York animation. Born in Brooklyn in 1925, Dick Rao was a graduate of the High School of Music. In nine, and Art and Music. In 1956, he moved to Westport, Connecticut, his wife Harriet's hometown. Dick worked as an animator and then as art director at the Optical House in New York, working on animation titles and special effects. In the 1960s, he served as president of Local 841 Screen Cartoonist Guild. He felt it behooved members to share their work in progress, including personal work. So screenings were held at union meetings. Dick and fellow members were intrigued by ASIFA. In 1966, the union sent Dick and designer Hal Silvermans as delegates to Annecy. The next spring, meetings were held at the Claridge Hotel in Times Square to form an association with ASIFA, and Seamus Colhane was voted in as president of the new chapter. Dick became its second president in 1969. In addition to his role as art director, Dick had become part owner of the Optical House. In this new role as a management side, Dick remained a champion of artists and proved to be a fair negotiator with the union. He wholeheartedly welcomed innovation to the field. And in 1971, Optical House purchased the first Cinetron motion control system ever. It married a HP computer and Oxbury stand with CineScan. In just a few years, this innovation was the industry standard. I first met Dick in 1984 as a young animation artist at that year's ASIFA judging. I recall him as well-grounded, enthusiastic leader whose love of animators, artists, and film was contagious. He was a terrific role model. In 1990, at age 65, Dick retired from the optical house He'd had a successful career filled with awards and accolades. He also stepped down as a 20-year president of ASIFA East. Dick retired to Connecticut, but not quite. He gardened and painted. He took a class at the Bronx Botanical Garden and was soon working as a natural science illustrator. Dick then went on to earn a doctorate in botany at age 76. He also began teaching classes at the Bronx Botanical Garden. 
Loving ferns, Dick naturally joined the American Fern Society, which met at the gardens. An enthusiastic fellow member proposed a group trip to Oaxaca to search for rare species. Dick and his wife signed on, Dick with sketchbook in hand. That enthusiastic fellow member was Oliver Sachs. Dick's illustrations can be found in Sachs's book, Oaxacan Journals. Dick Rowell served as president of the American Society of Botanic Artists, the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators, and other organizations. He continued to work and teach throughout his 80s. In 2006, at age 90, Dick entered three illustrations in the Royal Horticultural Society Flower Show in London, where he was awarded a gold medal and earned best in show. In 2006, I reconnected with Dick when I became a natural science illustrator myself. I joined the GNSI, and when I got my first newsletter, there was a group picture of the New York chapter. I did a double take. Wait, I know that guy. Our paths crossed many times after that, attending meetings, picnics, and exhibiting in group shows. In 2009, he permitted me to send out links to his of his Facebook profile, and it was wonderful to see him sharing posts with animation friends and colleagues in this new century. He continued working and teaching online throughout COVID. Last year, there was a retrospective of his work, which included an artist talk at the Westport Library. Dick Rao passed away peacefully on October 9th, 2023, in his own home with family nearby. He was 98. His joy and encouragement will be remembered by all who were lucky enough to spend time with him. He was predeceased by his wife, Harriet, of 67 years. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we're now going to uh, remember Michael Reeves. Uh, hmm? What? Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. okay um, He's a writer and story editor. Uh, uh, he, he had a multi-decade career at Hanna-Barbera, Warner Brothers, and DreamWorks TV animation. His credits include He-Man, the, the Masters Universe, Real Ghostbusters, um, My Little Pony, The Smurfs, Centurions, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Batman the Animated Series, for which he won an Emmy Award. So that's Michael Reeves. Um, we're now going to honor Paul Rubens, aka Pee Wee Herman. And the speaking about him is Phil Trumbo. Um, he's on Zoom. I don't know if he's. Is he there? Is Phil there? Phil there? Mm hmm. No, she didn't. She, I didn't think she was going to get any warning from us. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, I didn't oh. think so. I thought I might have missed it. <clears throat> is he not on? Yes. Yeah, coming on. Yeah. You can now oh. Oh, okay. Hey, can you hear me? There he is. Can you, can you guys see okay. can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, great to be here. Uh, th thanks, thanks for the um, opportunity. Um, I'm just trying to get my cheat sheet up so I can see it. <laughs> Great. Okay. If you want to run that, I have a video. If you want to run that, uh, that would be great. Terrific. When Paul made his breakthrough feature film, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, of course, he chose an animator, Tim Burton, to direct it. In 1986, Paul created the groundbreaking Saturday morning TV show, Pee Wee's Playhouse and Broadcast Arts, where I was an animation director in New York City, was tapped to be the production partner to help bring the playhouse to life. This was not your typical Hollywood production. Our studio was just around the corner from CBGB's and the Playhouse live action set was filmed down Broadway in an unair conditioned sweatshop loft. Mm -hmm. In addition to the amazing groundbreaking live action, Paul challenged our studio to create several innovative animated sequences. There was Penny, a claymation little girl animated by Nick Park who went on to create Wallace and Gromit. There was the ant farm who cheerfully greeted Pee Wee every episode animated in 2D cutout on a light table. Then there was the king of cartoons who introduced classic vintage animation from the 30s to brand new audiences. And then Lawrence Fishburne, as Cowboy Curtis, discovered that there was stop motion life in the fridge. <laughs> there was also an exploration of early CG and video effects animation. 
um, which Paul really encouraged exploration of all these different forms of animation in addition to the live action and puppets. And then there was the unforgettable weird toys that inhabited the playhouse and heavily influenced the mutant toys in Pixar's Toy Story. My role was the, direct, the director of the elaborate opening title sequence, but Paul had a very specific idea of what he wanted and our motion control camera tests weren't quite capturing the vision. Mark Mothersbaugh, who was composing the opening theme music, had similar challenges getting a sign off from Paul. He was on his 10th remix of the opening and I was on my 19th motion camera test. We finally got to see Paul in his dressing room. I queued up my latest motion test on the VHS. Mark queued up the theme music on Boombox. We pushed the buttons together and Mark's music played. And Paul said, yeah, I like it. That's just what I was going for. I was also the director and storyboard artist on the stop motion dinosaur family that lived in a mouse hole in the playhouse. Brilliant stop motion animator Kent Burton and I collaborated on bringing the characters to life. Our goal was to achieve the quality and subtlety of stop motion pioneer Ray Harryhausen. Paul gave us tremendous creative freedom on this project and encouraged us to improvise our animation to work with the live action. You need a good producer. That was Prudence Fenton. Paul was involved in creating and approving everything. He could sometimes be quite difficult to work with, but his suggestions usually turned out to be really positive and helpful. I got to do some drawings. And when you connected with him, finally, it really felt like you'd, you'd achieved something. You really felt like you had a, a creative union of sorts. So Paul, Thanks a lot for your creativity and imagination from all of us who are entertained by and work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we now like to honor uh, Jeff Ritchie. And uh, just Jeff, you got a speech? Okay. Jeff Ritchie has credits for background painting on animated shows stretching from 1987 to 2002 and including Scooby-Doo, The Smurfs, Family Dog, and The Critic. Jeff seems to have been a quiet and private person. His co-workers, Joanna Ramersa, Dennis Venezuelos, Phil Philipson, Ethel Marion Ferreira, all say so, and that he was easy to work with and very talented. There seems to be no obituary to be found about Jeff online nor is there a photograph of him, neither his birth date or date of death. Notice came to us from the IATC pension fund that he was deceased, and so we remember him. Now, when Dave asked me to write, read for him, I was interested because I am one, I seem to be one of the very few people besides those four mentioned who actually remember Jeff Ritchie. Mm -hmm. And the reason I remember him is that um, he, he, he and I had a friend in common who was a Cuban background artist named Martin Forte. Now, Jeff Ritchie's last name, as you can see, is R-I-C-H-E, and Martin's last name is Forte, F-O-R-T-E. And therefore, Martin seems to have decided that Jeff's name should be Jeff Ritchie. Now, I didn't know Jeff Ritchie very well, but I'm reasonably certain that he knew how to pronounce his own last name. So that's what I remember about Jeff Ritchie. Thank you. That's for, it's ironic that uh, Martin Forte is going to be in the, in the, uh, on this program next year because oh. he passed away just a, a few weeks ago. Really? Yeah. My God, he lasted that long. Yeah. Good yeah, for him. Yeah. So, okay, so now we're going to honor uh, Nellie Rodriguez. Uh, Nellie worked as a painter at, at Filmation, Rich Entertainment, Hanna Barbera, Walt Disney, Croyer at Warner Brothers. Her um, multi decade career included credits on Little Mermaid, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Rainforest, um, Black Cauldron, Jetsons, the movie, and Batman, the animated series. Uh, we're now going to honor uh, Jesse Romero, and the speak about Jesse Romero is uh, is uh, Chris Merck uh, uh, song. Did I get that right? Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> 
Hi, everybody. It's me again. Um, Chris couldn't be here, so I'm going to read his loving speech. Um, Chris Mickey Song wrote this letter to Jesse, his friend. Hey, Jesse, I'm writing this letter with a mix of emotions, thinking about all the great adventures we went through together in both the animation industry and in life overall. We worked on many different shows and many different studios, but I was lucky enough to work with you at most of them. Things wouldn't always sail easy for us, but you handled all the matters around you with positivity. A family guy who always put your family first, your Bible was never far away. I will never forget the spiritually filled man I admired and looked up to. I still remember the very first time we met, you were one of the first to approach me, greeting me with a big smile and an extremely firm handshake that is still unforgettable. Your warm and genuine welcomes were always accompanied by a hug that made everyone feel comfortable and at ease. And that was truly your special talent and gift. Your jokes, your smile, they will all sorely be missed. Your absence is certainly felt by all your peers in the room today and their memories of you fill the room with love and joy. So, hey, Jesse, I just wanted to say thanks for being such an awesome and impactful friend. I will cherish the photos and memories I have with you more than ever. You'll always have a special place in my heart. We miss you. Thank you. Hey, we're now gonna honor uh, Joy Rosen. And speaking about Joy Rosen is Linda Siminski. Is it a film? A clip? There she is. Oh, there she is. Oh, hey. Hi, everyone. So uh, first of all, thank you for including Joy Rosen today. Um, a lot of you probably didn't know Joy, uh, but if you worked in international animation, you definitely would have known Joy. Uh, she was a co-founding partner and CEO of uh, the Toronto-based production and animation company Portfolio Entertainment. <laughs> she started the company with Lisa Ulfman, the co-CEO in 1991. And the first series they produced was the puppet show Groundling Marsh for PBS way back in the 1990s. And then uh, their company was also the producers of The Cat in the Hat, knows a lot about that, and Hero Elementary, which were both for PBS Kids. Uh, up till that point, I had known them for years, and uh, although Cat in the Hat was the first time that we had actually worked together. So Joy was in charge of strategy, business, sales, that sort of thing for the company. And uh, she was a key part of the growth and success of the company. And the company was incredibly successful and grew a lot in uh, the years where she was running it. Uh, incidentally, they were also one of the few female owned and run uh, animation production companies that I can think of up in Canada. And uh, recently, Portfolio was in the news again because they were acquired by Nine Story Media Group. Now, the main thing you might want to know about Joy, and probably what she'd want you to know, was that she was really, really funny. And her obituary even uh, mentioned this. It mentioned her wicked Canadian sense of humor. And I'd like to mention that's humor spelled H-U-M-O-U-R, because she was Canadian. Um, and, and that was actually very accurate, because if you sat, sat down with Joy, it was a little like being on a talk show with a comedian crossed with your most high-spirited and opinionated Jewish cousin. Um, on the other hand, you didn't want to be negotiating against her because she was also really good at that. Uh, she was an important person in Canada's animation scene for more than three decades. She was a good friend, a great colleague, and an excellent source of commentary and information. And uh, she is certainly missed. Thank you. We now like uh, we now like to talk about Bill Rizika, and um, uh, speaking about Bill Rizika is Jules uh, Aquimatal. Jules had hopes to be here today, but he himself had a funeral to attend. His, uh, 
he had an in-law who passed away. So he writes this about William Rosica. I knew Will back when we worked together on G.I. Joe Renegades back in 2010. And that was the first time and last time we worked together. I really enjoyed talking to him about anime. I remember sitting near him from my cubicle and he would be blasting anime music from headphones. I would have to go over there and ask him what he was listening to. At one time, he said he was listening to the soundtrack of Paprika and highly recommended the film. So I checked out the film a few days later and to this day, it is one of my favorite anime films ever. His knowledge of anime was unique and I owe it to him for opening up my eyes to that genre. Miyazaki was always my number one guy, but Satoshi Kon, the director of Paprika is a close second. Anyway, rest in peace, my friend. You were very talented, kind and funny friend and colleague. I hope we meet again in paradise and talk more about anime. God bless, Jules. We're now gonna uh, pause to honor Cindy Sanderson. And um, I'm gonna speak about Cindy and all. Uh, she was a, uh, she was a career assistant in between her and uh, assistant animator at uh, Warner Brothers, Rich, Hyperion, uh, Bakshi, Walt, Hanna-Barbera, Disney, just like she just worked everywhere. Her credits are include like Space Jam and Cool World and Jetsons the movie. I remember when I first moved to uh, California, I was uh, I was rooming with a friend uh, near Filmation, but I had a job at Hanna-Barbera. So I was one of those weirdo New Yorkers who would take the bus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, you took the bus and all like that. And, and, uh, and the, the only other person on the bus with me was Cindy, Cindy Sanderson, because she was also going there. So we had a chance to have like a number of like long conversations. And she was a very, um, she was a very prim lady. She was very, she was very so sort of like a, a joyful eccentric and everything. Like, I think she liked being the, the kind of person you would say is kind of kooky, <laughs> you know, just fun. She was like the world's greatest Alfred and the Chipmunks fan. She loved Alvin and the Chipmunk. She collected everything and all. I, I figured after a while that she must have worked on it, but she didn't. She just loved Alvin and the Chipmunks. That was it. You know, you just couldn't say anything about it and all. And, uh, but she was just a lot of fun and a very sweet person. So, you know, rest in peace, Cindy. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. We're now going to honor the, uh, the great Belgian filmmaker, Raoul Servé. And speaking about Raoul as, as Paul de Meyer. Okay, my mic went off. Oh, can oh we me? can hear you. Hear okay, you. Great. great. So, well, thank you, thank you for uh, this opportunity to to mention Raoul. He um, he was my teacher in Belgium. I, I was born in Belgium, and we were both from. Uh, close from from each other's uh, homes and he he uh, he was already when i started to go to the royal academy of kent you know to do animation he he already had had like 40 something international film awards um uh, you know for his short films and he he was really um uh, a phenomenon in 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 belgium for that reason and we were kind of intimidated by that, but also by the fact that his presence was very distinguished. You know, although he, you know, he would always be wearing uh, like a, a jean outfit and and uh, often be unshaven because he'd been working late the night before on, on one of his movies. He he was he was kind of intimidating. You know, his demeanor was very kind of slow, and you know, if you talk to him, he would kind of look you in the eyes and. And then take a, a minute and then respond. And it, it was interesting that it's only like a few years later when I met him on on the, the commuter train, uh, because I, I was commuting, uh, still living with my parents, and I, I walked into him in, in the station and we chatted. And eventually, we started to talk our West Flemish dialect, you know, <laughs> and uh, and there was just this. We, this warming up and and I saw him as a a warm person, almost like family. And 
and uh, slowly we became friends. And I remember on on that first time I met him on the train, he, he you know I said that I was kind of like thinking of maybe becoming a, a teacher eventually. And then lo and behold, five years later, I was teaching at the Royal Academy, and uh, which I did for five years, and you know, and then moved on. But we always stayed friends. He was born in. In 1938, which means that, you know, from the, the year when he was 12 years old, the Second World War started and and there was four years of war really had a great uh, impact on him. And his films are, are all about uh, abuse of power, uh, fascism, but also abuse of power in, in smaller relationships or about... Uh, uh, being kind of limited in, in in the way we look at things, you know, like chromophobia. One of his early films is, is is about this army that enters in a colorful world and just makes everything black and white. Or he's got this film uh, uh, to speak or not to speak, which is all about uh, uh, shutting up people, you know, not letting not letting a free expression happen. And at the time, I thought, well, that's a bit passe, you know. In the seventies, you know, we had. That was like Second World War stuff, but you know, it, it now it's so present. You know, like thirty-seven of the United States are are are, are uh, shutting down uh, libraries, not shutting down libraries, but you know, uh, banning certain books for children, and and uh, it, it's it's you know, we don't know what's what's coming, but it but you know, his his message was very important, and uh, so I. To keep it short, because I, I could talk on, I, I could talk for an hour about Raoul, but uh, his film Harpia, one of his uh, short films, uh, went on to win the, the Palme d'Or, and, and that film you can find on YouTube if you don't know his work. And I think I think it's a, it's an important part of, of of his career, you know, which made him really known internationally. The um, I think I will keep. I'll have to stick to this because of time restraint, but I really want to thank you for including Raul in this afternoon of remembrance. Uh, he was indeed a you know a, a great figure. He was uh, president of Asifa International for ten years or something, and and uh, he loved coming here. And he, he had great friends here in LA, and a lot of them have passed on by now. But uh, but. Uh, he he was a, a great guy, a great man, and uh, and a very inspiring filmmaker. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to um, honor Sergei Ser Seryogin, and uh, Seryogin was a uh, uh, animator director in Russia. Uh, and was the founder of uh, Firebird, a children's animation festival in Novosibirsk. So that's uh, Sergei. Uh, we're now going to talk about Jeff Scott Smith. And speaking uh, on behalf of Jeff is uh, Ashley Long. I met Jeff Scott Smith, just Jeff Scott, as he was known to us on American Dad. I was a revisionist in the early years of my career and he was then a storyboard artist and retakes revisionist, steadily approaching retirement. Out to pasture, he would jokingly call it. I remember that he hoped to spend retirement up in the mountains skiing. And I really hope he at least made it up to a cabin to sip hot cocoa toward the end. After I left the show, it was hard to stay in touch because he was not a social media guy or even really an email guy. A handful of times when I stopped by the building for a visit, I might happen to find him outside smoking a cigarette and looking deep in thought. He would snap back to reality and give me the biggest surprise smile. He'd wave all the smoke away so we could catch up for a few minutes. He said he knew the young people didn't like cigarettes anymore. <laughs> I didn't know Jeff all that well. I don't think many people did. He didn't seek to be the center of attention and would be found quietly observing on the edge of crew gatherings or politely ducking out the door, hoping nobody would notice the six foot four guy with hippie hair exiting. None of us could find any photos of him from all the time I worked there. 
I'm a little convinced maybe he was actually a Bigfoot. <laughs> I know that he had a daughter and that he battled cancer during his last years on American Dad before retiring. I know that he was always so kind and supportive of an obnoxious young artist. <laughs> and that he was surprisingly funny if you stopped long enough to listen. For these reasons, I wanted to make sure somebody came here today to remember him. A kind person whose memory stuck with you is well worth our time to honor. We'd now like to remember Alan, uh, Alan Stovall. And speaking about Alan is uh, Al Holter. Thank you. Alan Stovall had a very big life and I have a very small amount of time and what has to be left out is painful. I'll give you a bit about what I know about Alan Stovall. His interests stretched um, to areas beyond a general audience. And besides animation, his ideas encompassed health and spirituality, plants and astronomy, Carl Jung, uh, Kurosawa, Monty Python. His friend Mark Myers said, he was equally at home with philosophy and bowling, sometimes at the same time. <laughs> he was a committed vegetarian as long as I knew him. The thing about Alan was he was quick, whip smart, and he was often saintly uh, patient with how long it took others to catch up with him. Although uh, we shared many interests, it startled me that his impulse was to always move a step beyond. If someone uh, someone's lecture interested me, I'd give it to Alan, and he would correspond with the speaker, and he'd get on the mailing list and be the first to know uh, that a seminar was happening. I'd attend a seminar, and Alan would be doing the audio recording, wiring up the speakers and checking sound levels and dubbing off copies of the talks. He was hard to keep up with. We, he enjoyed camping and hiking and exploring the outdoors. And if you were a guest joining a dozen folks on a hiking exploration, uh, Alan's remarkable stride and pace would always take him far out in front of the group. He was hard to keep up with. We met in 1980 at CalArts. He had come from Dallas, Texas to Jules Engel's film graphics program. I was in character animation. Our paths converged doing effects animation for um, feature films. We came to share this uh, lofty Aristotelian landscape of fire, water, earth, and air, and spit takes. Um, a Virgo, Alan was noted for his attention to detail. Thank you. <laughs> in the early 1980s, he'd worked at Filmation on various shows. And in the late 80s, he contributed to commercials at Duck Soup. His effects animation work came into orbit around Disney with credits on Little Mermaid and Brave Little um, um, Beauty and the Beast. And, before he, and uh, we worked together on Fern Gully and two Turner feature animation show films before he returned to Disney to work on Hercules and Tarzan. As we have so little time, I'll skip over the part from the mid to late 80s when Alan moved to Managua, Nicaragua to work on the housing project uh, department creating this handbook depicting how to build a how to build a home using mostly drawings and no text or very little text. I'll show it to anybody who'd like to look at it afterwards. Alan um, had a great interest in music, and he owned more CD mu music CDs than anybody I knew. All kinds of music, from rock and roll to eccentric modernist stuff to even African water slap percussion music. Perhaps through his musical interests, Alan developed a skill at recording and editing sound. And that technical prowess spilled over into videotape editing. Many people in animation knew Alan because he'd mastered the assembly of their sample reels. Now, for those younger, I should explain that at one point in time, uh, it, you needed to submit a portfolio and a VHS tape of your work which later led to DVDs and directions to websites. And in each case, Alan mastered all those various needs to assemble people's work and make them shine. As feature projects would near completion, crews would start to line up for Alan to sum up their work to present and be able to move on to the next project. It was a kind of a side gig, but 
uh, working on websites supported him when 2D animation evaporated. Alan was um, curious about traditional medical ideas in the East and West, acupressure, flow of energy, chi, plant tinctures, yoga, aromatherapy, and he had an abiding mistrust in Western allopathic medicine, at times to the exasperation of his friends. Briefly, several imbalanced falls injured his head and a series of setbacks eventually led to his passing last April. Alan was a devoted and loving husband to his wife, Jennifer, of 23 years. Many will miss our dapper friend, Alan Stovall. Thank you. The final five. <laughs> We're reaching the end here. Okay, so let's, uh, next we'd like to honor uh, Helene Tangway, 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 okay. And uh, speaking about, uh, for her is uh, Wendy Tilby or, and Amanda, Amanda Forbes. okay. Hello everybody. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about Helene. Um, how does one sum up Helene Tangway? It's, uh, it's impossible, but do let us try. Um, Alain was marketing manager in the English animation studio at the National Film Board for many, many years, but that doesn't even begin to describe how deeply engaged she was with the world of short animated film. <coughs> it wasn't a job for her, it was her life. She loved everything about the medium and was known for her vast knowledge, her great instincts and impeccable judgment. More than that, she loved people and they loved her back. Ellen was the queen of animation at all the festivals, and she knew everyone. She was a true extrovert in a sea of introverts. Countless young animators from all over the world were taken under her wing, and once she was a friend, she was a friend for life. Um, we dedicated our film, The Flying Sailor, to Ellen. Um, its first screening was after our final mix in Montreal, and Ellen was too sick to attend. So she was brought in on Zoom on a laptop. And so there she was um, sitting on the mixing board, uh, her head almost life-size, laughing, joking, being her irrepressible self. And we were so choked up because she was sick at the time and, and uh, you know, the end was coming uh, that we couldn't even properly introduce the film. We just, our throats tightened up and we just said, just, just roll it. And so uh, we played the film and it was the first time Elaine saw it and first time she saw the dedication. And it was very important to us that uh, Elaine like the film and hopefully feel honored by the <laughs> dedication. So the lights came up, we were still incredibly choked up and Elaine was wiping tears from her face. And she uh, she said, murmured a couple little things and and we st we really couldn't talk at that point. We were so choked up. And she was, she was kind of speechless. And then she said in her Quebecois accent, when I saw the dedication, I thought to myself, thank God it didn't say Elin Tanguay, R.I.P. And so of course we all laughed and it broke that uh, too emotional moment. So Elin was a connector, a protector, an ambassador, a dedicated gossip, a deeply feeling person, and above all a bon vivant right up to the last minute. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about this wonderful person. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to honor uh, Osamu Chesica and speaking about uh, him is uh, uh, Ed Gaskew. Uh, this is an excerpt from uh, Toei Animation, where he was a president and CEO. Uh, Osamu Tezuku, uh, Toei president and CEO, passed away at the age of 62, as confirmed by Toei. Tezuka, who served as the, uh, the company for nearly 40 years, held various roles, culminating in his appointment as president and CEO in 2020. Born in 1960, Tezuka played a critical role in, to critical, critical role in Toei, the renowned animation studio responsible for the iconic anime franchises such as Dragon Ball, Sailor Moon, One Piece, and Digimon. 
Under Tezuka's leadership, Toei achieved significant success with the last year's theatrical releases, One Piece film, Red and the Red, and the first slam dunk film. Contributing to record-breaking box office earnings, Toei's impact on the animation industry and its global reach remain profound. We're now going to, um, oh, the, okay, so so that's before Mel Vallis, right? So Celia Van Dyke's next, okay. All right, so we're gonna honor um, Celia Van Dyke and speaking about Celia Van Dyke is Ron Diamond. Is Ron there? Oh. Ron, are you there? Maybe that he was there earlier. He just spoke the other day. Mm -hmm. he didn't remember. So you think no, he dropped out? I guess out? you'll have to talk. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, uh, she was a Netherlands born and based animation producer. Celia Van Dyke received numerous awards in tandem with her husband, Garrett Van Dyke. Um, she won an Oscar for, uh, for Best Animated Short Film as a producer of Anna and Bella, directed by Borger Ring. Celia founded this distribution company, Animated People, in order to reach a wider audience for Dutch animated films, was a board member of the Holland Animation Association, and uh, participated in advisory committees with grant awards, an active uh, festival selection committee for juries around the world, and was a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. So that's Celia Van Dyke. Okay. Uh, do we have uh, Mil Fallis? Okay, there we go. So uh, for Mil Fallis, we have a, a message from uh, his son, Paul, read by Beth Ann McCoy. Key. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Milton in Pacific Rim in mainland China. I am going to read what Paul wrote, but I would also have something that I wrote. So after leaving the Navy, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Milt attended college at the California State University in Northridge, where he studied history and philosophy with plans to graduate and work as a college professor. And if you knew Milton, Oh, he was a great conversationalist. He could talk about everything. I so enjoyed hanging out and talking with him. While attending college, Mill took a job at Hanna-Barbera Studios where he worked in Xerox and camera. And in spite of earning a bachelor's degree in the history of philosophy, Milt's love for animation industry kept him out of the classroom and provided him with a lifelong career. Over the years, Milt worked for several companies, including a stone starting his own animation studio with longtime friend Mike Kinney. His growth and success in the industry allowed him to travel the world and practice one of his other great loves, which was photography. Milt's love of film and photography is evident as the walls of his home and studio are filled with many of his beautiful photographs. He made many friends and touched many lives along the way. Despite his enormous size and stature, Milt was a teddy bear at heart who loved to share his passions for cooking music with friends and family. Even in retirement, Milton became active and continued to write scripts and blogs for the animation industry. Although he traveled less, Milt remained an avid photographer. He continued writing his blogs and photography with the worlds he so greatly loved in his final days. Milt passed away on December 5th, 2023, with his immediate family beside him. He left the earth in no pain and distress. He left behind 78 years of memories, love and laughter. Oh, he is survived by his wife, Yolanda, his son, Paul, and his grandchildren, Isabella and Mark. And like I said, I met Milton a long time ago when he was at Kinney Vallis. And I'd just like to say, when you meet somebody in your life that changes you, Milt was one of those people. From the first time at Kinney Vallis, we just hit it off. Um, the Vallis family became my family at a time when I needed to find my way in the world. Milt, 
and his beautiful wife, Yolanda, were there to guide me. And eventually I joined Milton in the grand adventure of working in the first solely owned American animation studio in the PRC. Together with other great animation professionals, we made here history and experienced history firsthand. I will always cherish my memories and friendship with Milt. He gave me a chance at a great career that changed my life forever. Rest in peace, big fish, you are missed. Um, I'd just like to say like some of the great people that passed through Pacific Rim were uh, Mike Kinney, Rich Trueblood, Robert Tyler, uh, Norm Drew, he wrote something. Let me find it really quick. Uh, I just, oh my God, here it is. Uh, okay. This is what he wrote about Milton. Milt was kind, an understanding friend who restored one's faith in humanity. Having all found our animated life in this chaotic world, I'm sure we'll all happily meet up again in animation heaven. God bless Milt. God bless us all. Norm Drew, IATSE member since 1963. But uh, yeah, Milt was a great guy and he was really big. He was the big fish. And if you had the opportunity to know him, he was really fantastic person and greatly missed in this industry. Thank you. Okay, finally, we'd like to honor John Warnock. Uh, John was a, CG, a CGI pioneer, is the founder of Adobe Systems and is the reason why you sometimes have images that say PDF on them. <laughs> so so, so he, he invented that. So uh, speaking about him is uh, I'm, I'm uh, taking excerpts from uh, an address by Peter Shirley, who is the Dean of the Utah School of Engineering about, about his friend, John. So John Warnock, Warnock, a University of Utah alumnus, computer graphics pioneer, co-founder of Adobe passed away August 19th. He was 82 years old. Born in the suburbs of Salt Lake City, Warnock received a bachelor's degree in mathematics and philosophy from the U in 1961. He would go on to earn a master's degree in mathematics and in 1964, then a doctorate in, in electrical engineering. He would publish his algorithm for removing the hidden lines in early computer graphics the following year, paving the way for realistic digital images. Um, Warnock's doctorate thesis, a hidden surface algorithm for computer generated halftone pictures was the foundation contribution to the field of computer graphics. In it, Warnock demonstrated his method for breaking down three dimensional images into a collection of polygons that would be visible from any given viewpoint with each polygon simple enough to be digitally rendered on the, on the computers of the time, the Warnock algorithm was responsible for the first realistic computer software generated images. After a stint with one of the first commercial computer companies, Evans and Sutherland, founded by his advisor, David Evans, and PhD committee member, Ivan Sutherland, uh, and serving as a principal scientist at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox Park, Warnock and collaborator Charles Getschke founded Adobe Systems. John's work on, the, uh, um, on translating physical images to digital ones had in its seeds, uh, had in its seeds at ENS and had been continued at Park, came full circle at Adobe with the development of PostScript, a computer language used to convert uh, digital images to physical ones by way of a printer. The portable document format or PDF, a uh, descendant of PostScript provided disability. Adobe would later extend their capabilities into the suite of digital publishing tools Technologies such as Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, InDesign, After Effects. Warnock's uh, fingerprints can be found on nearly every creative uh, pursuit in the industry. Uh, I started to think, how could you make a description of a printed page? He started working on that with some of the brightest people in the world, Warnock said. Xerox didn't understand it, so we left and started Adobe. And it was a pretty good decision, but I owe it all to the education I got. 
uh, here and everybody uh, that I knew at the university. So thank you very much for John Warnock. Okay. We, what? Was it? Oh, it's oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Was on was it on the page there? Oh, okay. All right. Niso Yamamoko. All right. Okay. Uh, this is an excerpt from uh, the obituary uh, for Niso Yamamoto. Uh, Mr. Yamamoto passed away on August 19th, 2023, due to uh, after a long battle with stomach cancer. Yamamoto's illustrious career gained recognition while contributing to the iconic films like Lupin the Third, The Castle of Calig uh, Calig Caliostro. Caliostro, sorry, and Studio Ghibli classics such as Castle in the Sky and Spirited Away. His profound impact on animation extended to non Miyazaki films like The Girl Who Leaped Through Time and Grave of the Fireflies, where he played a crucial role as an art director. Yamamoto's artistic journey also encompassed a personal project, The Hundred Famous Views of Goto, consisting of a hundred landscape paintings inspired by his hometown. Survived by his son, uh, Takeo, Yamamoto's legacy lives on through an ongoing exhibition at Hamamatsu Municipal Museum of Art, showcasing his significant contributions to animation and his deep connection to the landscapes that influenced his art. Thank you. Okay, now we're done. <laughs> so, great, well, thank you everybody. Um, as is our tradition, is the thing we always do. Um, can, we'd like everybody to stand for a second. What, what's that? Okay, all right, there's a whole list of a million other people that they that, that stuck on at the last minute that, 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 that we have to acknowledge that they exist. Well, while that's going on, can we have everybody stand for a moment of silence? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming and everything and for the afternoon and uh, have, a, have a pleasant weekend. Take care. <laughs>